Amen. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for the ability to assemble together and to worship you. Thank you for the freedom of religion that's been granted unto us from you. And so, Father, as we seek you in this, in this time, in this hour, your Holy Spirit is working. It's, he's moving. He's instructing. He's, he's changing lives and hearts. And so I thank you for that. Thank you for jobs. Thank you for raises, promotions. Thank you for witty inventions. Thank you, Father, for the creation of new jobs as we begin to seek you in this challenging time. Thank you for such a great people to assemble together and to receive of your great love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, I don't know if I'm going to use the TV screen like I've done in the past because we were using the screen primarily because of all of our locations and you didn't have to do any post uh, work on the message. You could get this stuff live at a location. And now that they've changed the format up, we're not sure how that is. But I missed my beloved TV and I just felt like <laughs> it wasn't right not to chop the TV. So I know some of you have missed that. And so I've got that out of my system now. Before COVID-19 hit, the Lord spoke to my heart very strongly about how the church, innocently I believe, but practically had become like a subculture within the culture. And that many things were happening in the church that were happening in the world because the church was just going along to get along. We don't want to be a contentious people. We don't want to, to be mean in any way or unkind. And so many times in the name of compassion and peace and a type or kind of love, Many things were just accepted in the church, and again, we became this subculture. And the Lord said that we are called as his people to be a counterculture to the culture. We are a culture of life. We are a culture of light, and we are a culture of love amidst a culture of death and darkness and hate. And God wants us to gather together, we've seen, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but we are to, as we see the day approaching, that's the day of the Lord, we are to provoke one another to love and to good works. One translation says we're supposed to stir one another up in love and in good works. See, the world and the devil wants to stir people up in hate and in evil works. And it's very real. And God is unveiling things. God is uncovering things in this hour. God is showing us the world we live in and how that we have to counter all this death with life. We have to counter all this darkness with light and we have to counter the hate with God's kind of, of love. And so it's so important that we understand God's love for us and that we continue in our growing in our knowing of God's love for us. And I'm going to show you that in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go there in just a moment. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. But we are to understand how faith works in the midst of a culture of great fear. We've seen in our last session. And in 1 John chapter 4 verse 18, the Bible says, There is no fear in love. But perfect love cast out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not perfected in love. Man, I just pray that you're allowing the Lord to open your eyes and see what fear can do to a culture. See with your eyes. Learn from this. Young people, pay attention because this is, this is the beginning of the end of, of, of time as we know it. This is just the beginning of pains that are coming as we see the day approaching and we cannot be manipulated by fear as the people of God. Amen. 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 Satan uses fear to control the masses and a fear of death. He uses darkness, lies, deception to lock people into this fear of death and obviously he uses hate that gets into the heart of man. Let me just encourage you as a human being, the human heart was never created by God for hate. It cannot contain hate. It's a poison in your heart that'll just ruin your life. And yet our culture 
without God is permeated with those things. So we've got to understand God's love because faith works by love, and God's love casts out fear. See, when I say that, people go, well, what are you saying? We shouldn't be cautious about the coronavirus? No, I'm not saying that, and I've labored to explain these things as best I can, as simple as I can, that we should be cautious about things, but not afraid. You need to be cautious concerning the flu, but not afraid. You need to be cautious about HIV, but not afraid. You need to be cautious when you drive your car, especially when I'm on the road, <laughs> but not afraid. How many people are killed in car accidents every year? And we can't allow fear of that to allow people to take our cars away. I said a lot without saying it. There's a lot of stuff to be afraid of. There's a lot of things we could overreact and lose our liberties and our freedoms. And I sh have shared with you how that many people, because of the fear of death, are no longer living their lives. And so we have to understand God's love for us in the midst of all of this because Galatians 5, 6 says that it's, it's, it's love and by God's love that our faith works. So let's look at this in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. And Paul is praying here, and you can read along with me now, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. See, Jesus dwells in our hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Notice that we need to be rooted and grounded in love. We don't need to just know about God's love. We don't need, need to be casual about God's love. We need rooted in it. We need grounded in it. And then he goes on to say that you may be able to comprehend or understand with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, verse 20, now unto him, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that worketh within us unto him, that's Jesus, be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end, amen. Notice that this now God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. That wasn't a thought disconnected from his love and knowing the, the length of it, the depth of it, the width of it, and the height of it. God's power is released in your life in any situation when you know how much he loves you. It's God's love for you and knowing it and knowing it that passes knowledge that now releases God's ability in your life to change your circumstances, to turn things around, to fulfill his will in your life. And yet, many of God's people really have no idea how much God loves them and the depth of it and the length of it and the breadth of it and the height of it. You know, if I was to ask most of you, how many of you know God loves you? Everybody in here would raise their hand and say, I know God loves me, but do you know it that passes knowledge? Do you know it beyond your five physical senses? Do you know it beyond carnal reasoning and carnal understanding? Because God's love is only known through certain avenues and they're not carnal. They're not of your senses. You don't know God's love for you because you feel something. You don't know God's love for you because you see something. You don't know God loves you because of circumstances in your life or answered prayers. I've heard people say like things like, well, I know God loves me. He answered my prayer. Well, what if you wouldn't have seen an answer to your prayer? Does that mean God doesn't love you? Well, I know God loves me because my spouse is has stayed with me. Well, I know God loves you too on that one. <laughs> Let that go. Uh, you can't judge or discern God's love for you because your spouse has stayed with you. Because if your spouse leaves you, does that mean God doesn't love you now? Do you know when you're going through a trial or an affliction or a type of Christian suffering, you'll always hear, until you get rooted and grounded. Now, there is a point where you can get so rooted and grounded in God's love, you won't hear these in your head. 
But until you get rooted and grounded in God's love, something bad will happen to you, a circumstance, a feeling, an emotion, your health goes awry, you lose your job, something happens. And you feel like God doesn't love you and you'll hear in your mind a voice say, if God loved you, why'd you lose your job? If God loved you, why'd you get COVID-19? If God loves you, why'd you get cancer? If God loves you, why did your spouse leave you when you did everything you knew to do to save your marriage? If God loves you, why are your children so mean to you? <laughs> Some of you laughed on that one, hallelujah. Bottom line is, I don't know God's love by my circumstances. I don't know God's love by my feelings or my emotions. I don't know God's love by all these things that many people judge God's love by. God has taught me how to know his love for me. And I've endeavored my entire life to teach you how to know God's love for you. Because you have to know God's love for you before you'll be filled with his fullness. And you have to know God's love beyond knowing, beyond knowledge, that'll release his power. Where he can do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. What is the power that's at work in us? It's faith. How's that faith work? By love. So you can never hear too much God loves you. You can never hear too much about God's love for you. You can never dig deep enough, wide enough, long enough, or high enough in regards to God's love for you. And I'm just glad that I'm still growing in my knowing of God's love for me. I pray you're still growing in your knowing of God's love for you. Amen? Amen. So how do we find God's love then? How do we discover God's love? How do we discern God's love? How do we judge God's love when we live in a world of such death? When we live in a world of such darkness? When we live in a world with so much hate? You'd be surprised, especially as I travel, how many people hit me up and say, if God is love and God's full of all this love, how come this is in the world? And how come that's in the world? And how come this happens? See, people judging God's love based on the circumstances of this life. When the Bible doesn't teach, that's how you know God's love, and that's how you discern God's love. So let me give you three things that we will spend the rest of our lives in community as we assemble because you cannot have a culture of love without these three things. If we are going to be a church that is a culture of love that will cast out all fear, then we are going to have to be rooted and grounded in three ways, three primary ways that God reveals his love. So let me give you all three and then I'll spend the rest of my time and just highlight these because again, we'll be spending forever on these. Number one, we know God's love by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit. You can only know God's love by the Holy Spirit. That's why it says there in Ephesians 3, and Paul is praying that we would know the love of God that passes knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? It's by the Spirit of God. It's by revelation. Number two, number two, the way you know God's love for you and the way you never waver when you're facing whatever you're facing in this life, whatever may come in the future and we all have to face together, we know God's love by the cross, by the cross. And that's why we have to keep preaching the cross and preaching the cross and sharing the cross and what happened at the cross and all that God did at the cross because the cross is a manifestation of God's love for you. And when you're feeling like God doesn't love you, you need to think about the cross, etc., etc. And then number three, the third way that we know God's love, the third way we find God's love is with the word the Word, both living, that's Jesus, and written, that's the Bible. That's the Scriptures. So let's look quickly at number one. Number one, God delights in revealing himself to you. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, God is love. So anything you see of God himself, you see love. And that is the mission of the Holy Spirit. That is the primary call of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Can we go to Ephesians chapter 1 there, verse 17? Paul is praying again, this beautiful prayer for Christians, for you and I. 
He says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. See, there's wisdom that's just natural wisdom of this world. But then there's the spirit of wisdom. That's the wisdom of God. That's the heart of God. That's the mind of God. He's praying that we would receive and that God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Revelation in the knowledge of him. It takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit to know God. You'll recall in Matthew 16 when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I the son of man am? And they said, well, some say this and some say that. John the Baptist, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. Christ there meaning Messiah. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus blessed Peter and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. It takes a revelation from God to know him. And it can't come through flesh and blood. It doesn't come through other people. It doesn't come through your own senses and flesh and blood. It comes from the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. That's why we have to have a culture that is sensitive to the Holy Spirit and that we grieve not the Holy Spirit or that we quench not the Holy Spirit because God sent the Holy Spirit to reveal the things of God to us. It's the Holy Spirit that opens the eyes of your understanding. It's the Holy Spirit that touches and convinces and con convicts your heart of who God is and what his plan for you is and his love for you is and things of this nature. So we need the Holy Spirit and we need to learn of the Holy Spirit. Again, we need to be sensitive to the Holy, to the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16, somebody said one time, well, you just said it's the Holy Spirit that reveals God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father. Which is, a, you said the Father revealed who Jesus was. And now you're saying it's the Holy Spirit that revealed. Why do you think the Father sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Why do you think Jesus said, do not leave, do, do, do not leave, tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. The promise of the Father. The Father sent the Holy Spirit to reveal God to you. It's only the Holy Spirit that reveals truth to you and I. And man, if you can't see, my, my heart, my prayers have just been intense that I've never thought we would have an opportunity to see in just two months the darkness that's all around us, the lies, the deception, the falsehoods, the bearing false witness, witness the agenda to produce fear and and, and, and just separate us from God and from each other. One of the reasons the devil attacks you at any level or the church at whole is to separate us from the love of God and God's love for one another. And anytime you see that, you're, 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 your internal alarm ought to go off and the Holy Spirit ought to be screaming at you. The minute anybody shuts down a church, you, you're supposed to be suspicious of that. You're supposed to go, wait a minute. You know, I don't know. I got all excited the first of the year, and a lot of stuff has happened since then. <laughs> kind of calmed me down a little bit. Well, one of the things I, I thought, well, I just, for the young people especially, I, I need to minister on socialism and communism, and it felt funny. And I remember when I said it publicly, you could just feel the nervousness of, you're going to minister on socialism, on communism? I mean, I'm, I'm coming to church. Amen. Not realizing again that the older generation, the chronologically challenged among us. <laughs> no, the evil of communism. You can't pay a college professor enough to pollute their brains. And convince them that socialism and communism is good. But yet, how do you connect? How do you explain to young people the evil of socialism? Of state-run lives? 
of a police state of you not having autonomy in your business. And you're, you're told, I, I, can you imagine on January 1st if I'd have stood up and said, look folks, you'll be told by the government one day if you can or cannot work. People would have thought I've lost my mind. And yet we've had a window of which God promised me in 2016 he was going to unveil corruption. We've had a chance to see what socialism looks like. We've had a chance to see what communism looks like. That you can go to the beach, one governor said, you can go to the beach, but if you get in that water, we're going to get you out. A cop's going to pull you out of the water and put you in jail. I thank God for this weekend. I'm wearing a tie. In honor of people that laid their lives down. They gave their life. No greater love has a man than this. Than that he lay his life down for, for his friend. People gave their lives so we could be free. They literally died so we could go to work. So we could go to church. So I could stand up here and have freedom of speech. I can speak the truth now in love. I live in a, a country where my God-given rights are protected by a constitution for me to be able to tell people the truth whether they want to hear it or not. And nobody can tell me I can't speak the truth. Nobody can tell me I can't worship God the way the Holy Spirit has revealed to me and the way the Holy Spirit has led me to worship my God. Thank God for freedom. Thank God there's a few of us left that would literally say, give me liberty or give me death. And yet people don't don't know how to yield to the Holy Spirit to open their eyes. Not to be critical of other people, not to be mean, but to not be duped. To not be imprisoned. To not be enslaved. To not allow the spirit of Antichrist to keep us from sharing the good news openly and freely and able to share it with the whole world. Thank God for Jesus. Yes, thank God for the, for the Holy Spirit. But thank God again for men and women that were willing to die that we might be free. That we might be free. Man, I don't take it lightly and the only reason I don't talk about it publicly very much is I don't want to stand up here and boo-hoo. I don't want to stand up here and cry because I don't take it lightly and I cover it up with my smile as my eyes water up because I appreciate the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us now into all truth. John 14 and John 16, he's called the spirit of truth because we can count on him speaking the truth to us so we can make good decisions for our lives. All right, number two, number two is the cross. The cross, the way I know God's love for me isn't because I feel it always. The way I know God's love for me isn't because I never have a problem. Well, I know God loves me. I never have a problem. I know God loves me. I've never had a heart attack. Amen. Sorry, those of you that don't know me to have no idea what I just said. Hallelujah. You don't know God's love for you because you don't have a problem. You don't know God's love for you because you don't go through something. You don't, you don't know God's love for you because you've never been through any suffering. You know, I know God loves me. I've never suffered. No, I know God loves me because of the cross, because of the cross. Now, I'm going to look at some of these because this is huge to me. I've got an entire series I did on the cross, and of course, all my identification teachings are preaching the cross, and that's God's love for you is him ide identifying with your humanity and weakness so you can identify now with his deity and strength by his amazing grace. Everybody knows, I believe, John 3, 16, for God so loved, he didn't just love, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting, everlasting life. That's a reference to the cross. It wasn't God's love that just gave us Jesus. Hey, I love you, there's my son. It wasn't that he gave Jesus. No, he gave Jesus to us, up for us on a cross 
to redeem us all back to him. That's how much God loves you is that he gave Jesus for you. He gave the very life of Jesus, and that's what the cross is to remind you of every time we talk about it, speak of it, etc., etc. Look at 1 John 3, 16. Hereby, I love that, even in the King James Bible. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Think about that for a minute. Hereby, or here's how we perceive God's love for you. Pastor, how do I perceive God loves me. It seems like nothing is working out good for me. If God loves me again, why is my life such a wreck? Amen. Hereby, here's how we perceive God's love because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know God's love for you by the cross not by your circumstances. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses, verses 9 and 10 here. And this is beautiful. I want you to see this. I, I actually asked for the TV back because I wanted to really hone in on these. And it helps me. I don't know if it helps you, but one more week won't hurt us. <laughs> in this was manifested the love of God. Think about that for a minute. In this was manifested in what was manifested the love of God? In this was manifest or manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Are you born again? Then God loves you. You couldn't be born again if God didn't love you. The way to be born again wouldn't have been made if God didn't love you. God loved you so much he gave Jesus up for you on a cross so you could have life evermore, eternal life. Look at verse 10, and it's the same thing. Herein is love. I know many of you don't appreciate these kind of things, but I love that kind of stuff. I'm a simple guy. I got to have it, if you will, in layman's talk. I got to have it in, in easy speech. Just give me the bottom line. And when I see stuff like that, I can't tell you what it means to me to be able to understand the Bible like that, to be able to look at that and go, herein is love. Wherein is love? Herein is love that your spouse will never leave you. Herein is love. Your children will sing your praises forever. Herein is love. Nobody will ever betray you. Herein is love. You're the cat's meow at work, and you won't be downsized. Y'all aren't getting what I'm saying. Because as soon as any of that kind of stuff doesn't happen, people waver whether God loves them or not. And that is the enemy trying to separate you from the love of God to hinder your faith, to produce fear, so you will do a piece of stupid. I haven't said that in a while, and it didn't even fly. I don't want to do a piece of stupid. And when you get in fear, you do dumb things. So you better learn to live in faith. How do you do that? Abiding in God's love and his love abiding in you. Herein is love. Not that we loved God. That means it's unconditional. It means we didn't earn it. it. means we didn't deserve it. Anybody happy besides me? <laughs> Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Look at this. How did he love us? and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the cross. So the Holy Spirit is number one. And listen to this. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's not shed abroad in our hearts by our feelings. It's not shed abroad in our heart by our circumstances. It's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Then he goes right into verse 6 through 8, talking about how Jesus died for us when we were ungodly, meaning we didn't deserve it. And then it said that God commended his love in verse 8 of Romans 5. Commended means proved. God proved his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we hated God, he loved us. When we rejected God, he accepted us. Amen. When we did nothing to earn, deserve, or occasion God's love, he loved us, not because of us, but in spite of us. That is not of this world. 
In 1 John chapter 4, again, verse 8, the Bible says, love is of God. Love is of God. Love is not of my five physical senses. Love is not of my feelings. Don't misunderstand me. Love will affect my feelings. Amen. But it's not of my feelings. Love is of God, not my feelings. Love is of God, not my circumstances. Love is of God, not of this world. The world has no idea or concept about God's love. So when you hear a news anchor that doesn't believe in the separation of media and state. That's a Dwayneism, hallelujah. Talk about love, they got no idea what they're talking about. The world's love has an agenda. The world's love is selfish. The world's love is self-serving. And I'm not condemning anybody of the world. Any love that's of me is of my senses. And it's selfish and it's self-centered. And sometimes I get the love of God mixed up in my life and heart with the love of Dwayne. And the love for Dwayne. Anybody love yourself? In an unhealthy way, don't raise your hand on that one. <laughs> there's a healthy love I can have for me, but there's an unhealthy love I could have for me that's self-centered, selfish, terrible, just terrible. And yet the love of God is shed abroad in my heart, A, by the Holy Spirit, and then B, a knowledge of the cross. A knowledge of, of the cross. All right. The third one is the word both living and written, the Word of God. Man, I tell you, even during this recent crisis and really having to seek God and focus and what is God doing, what is God saying, where are we at, where are we going, what do I need to do? Uh, I can't tell you personally how grateful I am for the Word of God, how grateful I am for things that are solid and sure and heaven and earth are going to pass away, but God's word will endure forever. You can count on God's word. God's word is consistent. God's word isn't vacillating. You don't read God's word one day and in God's word, he says, don't do that, Dwayne. Praise the Lord. I shared with you last week that we're being told so many things in the name of science and it is such faulty science that it changes every week and now it's changing every day. And yet we were supposed to believe the science two months ago and lay our lives down for science. That today they're saying the opposite. You got people saying we shouldn't shake hands and never shake hands, but having casual sex, internet hookups is okay. You got them telling you uh, two months ago, wearing a mask isn't healthy, it doesn't help. Now, if you don't wear a mask, you're going to jail in the name of science. Again, I'm not picking on mask. Wear a mask. Some of you look better in a mask. <laughs> oh, I did not mean that, but that was funny. <laughs> People are all touchy about all this stuff. I get it, so I'm trying to be sensitive, but I'm trying to share with you that we don't have anything to be worried about. We don't have anything to fear because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts and our faith is working. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He died on the cross for my health and he died on the cross for my eternity. I'm secure. And he wrote me a book and he sent his son that was the book with flesh on it so I would know what love looks like. And some of you younger people are going to snicker at me, but that's all right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to look at you. <laughs> but years ago, some of the older folk remember that we used to sing a song at church and, and it was a simple song, but it's like everybody believed it back then. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, to him belong. To him they are weak, but to them he is strong. Yes, Jesus loved me. I would sing it, but I don't want anybody leaving. Yes, Jesus loves me. This I know, 
for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> few, few older people. Everybody, I can remember when there was a phrase, you don't hear it anymore, but even people in the world would say this, man, I'm telling you the truth, it's the gospel truth. You don't even hear that phrase anymore. You used to hear it all the time. Lost people would say, I'm telling you, this is the gospel truth. Meaning that the gospel's true. Even lost people knew, well, the Bible's true. I don't like it. I ain't going to obey it. I'm going to reject the God of it, but the Bible's true. Everybody accepted that. Today, when I say the Bible says, people go into a meltdown. In certain sections in our culture, you can't bring up what the Bible says. That's why back to my socialism and communism comment and how I really thought I may need to minister on this for young people's sake. The first clue that communism is not a good idea is you got to remove the Bible. Think about that for a minute. Why in communist countries does the church have to go underground and do they burn the Bibles? Because if people read the Bible, they're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to make them free. So you got to burn the Bible. You got to shut churches down. Amen. This is all by design. It's demonic design. And there's a reason for it. The cool thing is, I wish I, these things come to me, and I, I don't want to ever falsify anything, but sometimes I get my, my facts mixed up, but uh, maybe Sue could help me out because I've been with her the most, so might have come from her, but <laughs> wait a minute now, everybody, be cool. Uh, more Bibles were sold in the last, was two months than in the last two years, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Some people are waking up and going, wait a minute, maybe we better read the Bible. Maybe God has something to say about life. Maybe God has something to say about work. Maybe God has something to say about our children and how to raise our children. <gasps> maybe God has something to say about our gender. Maybe God has something to say about, boy, I'm about to get in trouble and I'm being nice. But maybe God has something to say about a marriage. Maybe God has something to say about social distancing. Yeah. Your daughters that are dating, you enforce social distancing. <laughs> and the science is out on this deal. I guarantee you, it's healthy to practice social distancing till you get married. Till you get married. Isn't that a neat idea? I wonder where that idea came from. Came from the Bible. Came from the Word of God. Jesus came to show us the Word of God. He came to live it. One of my favorite sayings God ever g gave me was that Jesus is the Bible with eyeballs. <laughs> Jesus is the Bible with hands. Jesus is the Bible, the Word. John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, we saw God's glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, of his person. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says, Jesus is the visible member of the invisible God. God, the Father, hasn't been seen. No one's seen the Father but the Son, and the Son came to show us the Father. He came so that we could see what God looks like. And we're still mixed up. Amen. And we're mixed up in all these kind of extremes. Man, I don't want to be critical in this. I don't want to be misunderstood in this. I wouldn't call their name for anything, and I'm not being critical of them. I'm just making an observation. But I was watching this Christian TV show, and these nice women, beautiful women, godly women, Everything was great, and I thought it was awesome, so please don't misunderstand me. But they got to talking about Jesus, and they got to talking about raising their kids, and how that, that Jesus was so kind and loving, and they were implying that you should never discipline your kids. And they used the example of Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, and how he didn't shame her. He didn't condemn her. Now, I, I've taught that. He didn't shame her publicly. He didn't condemn her. 
But he didn't condone that kind of action. And in other settings where Jesus dealt with sin, he told people to go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. You have to teach your children consequences still, and that's love. You have to teach them boundaries, and that's love. You have to teach them right from wrong, that's love. And these ladies were implying, again, we don't discipline our children. We're just sweet and nice to them and kind to them. We just love on them. And I'm thinking, I love on them, all right. <laughs> Give them to me, and I'll get the devil out of them. Hallelujah. I'll just beat the, beat the devil right out of them. Hallelujah. I better let that go. It takes too much explanation. But the bottom line is, Jesus was not this passive, meek, quiet non-responsive man to what was going on around him. And that was love. It was love that rebuked the Pharisees. It was love that made a whip and ran the money changers out, beating people with a whip. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's no whip around here, and I'm not going to... We use a cattle prod. We use an <laughs> electric... We just, we just shock the devil out of, out of you, hallelujah, as we deal with things. And I know all this stuff, even what I'm saying now, you got to be so careful because people don't know how to listen. They don't know how to process, so they think you're saying something you're not saying. Jesus was very kind. Jesus was very, very polite at large in the sense of his personhood. But he dealt with sin, and that was called love. He rebuked the Pharisees with some words that are difficult to say publicly to this day, and that was love. One of the things we know about love is he didn't make anybody sick. Amen. If you catch any virus, God didn't do it. God didn't put it on you. Jesus healed all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So he showed us love heals. It doesn't make sick. Jesus didn't tell people don't go to work. He didn't shut people's businesses down in the name of some compassion or in the name of some kind of love. There are people on TV saying if we shut the whole country down and it saves one life, it would be worth it. And they think that sounds noble and godly. And while every life is precious and we should defend and stand for every life, nobody believes that. If we take all of your cars away, wouldn't that save just one life? Some of this thinking is demonic. It's the world. It is literally the spirit of antichrist. And we need to know what does the word say? What, what would Jesus do? Really, what would he do? I guarantee you, I know what he would do. Again, I don't want to pick on the mask. Why does this keep coming to me? Because I've been watching too much gun smoke. That's what the problem is. <laughs> Just every episode, everybody's got a mask. All the bad people are wearing masks. I'm not saying you're a bad person if you're wearing a mask. I'm saying it's on my head. But I mean, can you picture a picture of Jesus with a mask on, praying for the sick? You can't even fathom that. And again, I'm probably going to have to, I've got to get on a plane this week. And I think it's going to be mandatory that I wear a mask. And I'm just dreading it. And I'm, I'm, prob I'm going to do it. And I'm going to wear the mask that, that, that Danny bought me. It's a Dallas Cowboy mask. And I guarantee you, with a Dallas Cowboy mask, you won't catch a thing. <laughs> <laughs> You'll drop, you'll drop everything thrown your way. If it even comes in your area of the field, you'll drop it. So I know I'm safe. So I'm having to comply in areas. I'm simply trying to say God's word has revealed his love for us. And we need to trust God. We need to believe God, even when we're taking cautions. I actually understand the plain thing and that that air circulating and I'm okay with complying in that sense out of love for everybody else on the plane and not being contentious about it. So I know my heart in this. I'm trying to use some practical things that we're going through 
to make some points on, do we really know, though, what the Word of God says about God's love for us, even in the midst of a pandemic like this, even in the midst of things that are being said that is a part of a culture of death, things being said that is a part of a culture of darkness, things being said that's a part of a culture of hate versus a real culture of love. A real culture of love is, I guarantee you, I'm going to be praying for you and for your families and have been. That's a culture of love. We're, we've got to pray for the older, older, elderly among us because they are the most receptacle, receptacle, re, re, they receive this more than others. <laughs> Did you know 98% of everybody that's caught this virus recovers? 98%. And most that don't are those with pre-existing conditions or in a nursing home. There are things being unveiled and uncovered about nursing homes now that just break your heart. But as a culture of love, I can't tell you how good I felt when I began to see the reports about all the abuses in these nursing homes and people being put out to die. Because see, we live in a culture that doesn't value life in the womb and life near the tomb. I want that to sink in. We live in a culture that does not value life in the womb or life close to the tomb. And yet as a church, what do I mean? We're a counterculture of love. We fed over 400 meals to those in the nursing home here in, in Durant. Am I correct? I want to get the figures correct. 400 meals. That's a culture of love. Instead of putting the elderly out to die, instead of not caring about them and then abusing their numbers for a selfish gain, we went into the nursing home and fed them. That's love. That's a culture of love. That doesn't have an agenda attached to it. That doesn't have any selfishness attached to it. That's just one example of many of what it means to be a culture of love. We cannot be a culture of love if we don't know God's love for us. We can't know it without the Spirit, the cross, and the Word. So every time you come together, if we stir you up to love and to good works, how would we do it? How do we stir one another up to love and to good works? We preach the Holy Spirit. We honor the Holy Spirit. We follow the Holy Spirit. We yield to the Holy Spirit. We preach with passion and conviction the power of the cross, and we share the Word of God with all our hearts. Amen. Amen. A culture of love is saturated with those three elements. Man, I just pray this has helped encourage you and strengthen you as you go back out into a world that is a culture of death, that is a culture of darkness, that is a culture of hate, and you and I not return like for like. We are not to be a counterculture of death, countering death with more death, a counterculture of darkness. We lie in order to counter all the lying. That happens a lot in politics. That's not who we are. It's not that we don't and are not involved at all in politics, but we're not about politics. We're about the kingdom of God. So lying to counter a lie is terrible. And we don't return hate upon hate. A culture of love, when we're hated, we pray for our enemies. We pray for those that mock us and despitefully use us, persecute us falsely, all those kind of things. We pray for these people. That's a counter. That's a counterculture of love. Amen. Did anybody get anything today? Yes. Amen. Praise God. Man, I love you. And when I say I love you, I hope you know what that means even deeper after today. I want to pray for you. Father, I just thank you. If there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, that hasn't received your love, so that they can have faith, and that faith begins with knowing Jesus died for them on the cross, that they would make a commitment to Jesus today. If you're here today and you've not made a commitment to Jesus, you've not given him your life, you've not confessed him as your Lord, he loves you, will you love him back? He came to save you from all your sins, will you receive it today? Just accept it with childlike faith. 
If you want to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you're willing today to confess him as Lord, I want to pray for you right where you are. I want to lead you in a simple prayer of faith in receiving Jesus into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. Just raise your hand. Make sure I see your hand because I want to know who I'm praying for. I don't want to just pray in vain or generically. I want to know I'm praying for somebody that said, I want to make, make Jesus Lord of my life today. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you and then make sure I see it. Thank you, sir. You can put it down over here. Anybody else? Thank you. You can put your hand down here. God bless you. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hallelujah. Up, up in the balcony, I see your hands. God bless you. You can put them down. Thank you, Jesus. This is a big day. This is huge for people. This is eternity, folks. This is one of the reasons we're not to forsake assembling. People need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the good news because faith will always come when they hear it. Father, I thank you for these hands. I thank you for these hearts. You've seen them. You are here with us today. We do not assemble without you in the midst of us. You are with us today. And today as we make this confession of faith, as people acknowledge faith in you, thank you for a new creation. Thank you for a changed heart, a changed destiny, a changed life. Those of you that raised your hand, again, I prayed for you that if you believe in your heart, the Bible says if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess him with your mouth as Lord, you will be saved. We're going to pray a simple prayer with you. And again, if you mean it with all your heart, I promise you God will change your heart in Jesus' name. Let's all pray together with those that raise their hands. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I confess that I'm not right, but I want to be right. I want to make things right. I can't do enough to save myself. I can't quit enough to save myself. I need help, and I believe Jesus Christ is that help. He is the Son of God. He came to this world, lived a perfect life. He went to the cross to bear my sins. He bore my death and my punishment for all my sins. On the third day, he was raised again. He is alive, and I confess him as Lord, my Lord, my God, my King that is soon coming. Thank you now for forgiving me, cleansing me, washing me of all my sin, and changing my heart. Help me now from my heart to serve you all the days of my life. Amen and amen. Yeah, that's a good sound. That's a good sound.